There is no doubt that America under Donald Trump took a more pro-Israeli line than ever before. And at the heart of that was Trump's outspoken ambassador to Israel and also Trump's former lawyer, David Friedman. He's got a new book out, Sledgehammer, how breaking with the past brought peace to the Middle East. And he joins me now. Uh, ambassador Friedman, thanks so much for coming on the show this evening. Uh, it's a fascinating and provocative book you've written about your four years as U.S. ambassador to Israel. Uh, but let me start by asking what a lot of your critics have asked over the years, which is what do you think qualified you, a New York bankruptcy lawyer who represented Donald Donald Trump over his Atlantic City casinos with no experience of diplomacy, no known expertise in international law. What qualified you to be ambassador to Israel? Well, I'd been to uh, Israel about 100 times. I was fluent in Hebrew. I, uh, I had my bar mitzvah there in 1971. I, was, uh, uh, I studied international law at one of the best law schools in the United States. I wrote papers on it. Uh, I continued to study it and visit and meet with Israeli leaders and meet with, occasionally with some uh, Arab leaders. It's been a matter of, uh, of great interest to me for my entire life. And um, and I was able, I believe, very quickly to forge very important relationships with the Israeli leadership. And you write in your book, Ambassador, about how people were against your confirmation. You write at length about uh, all of the kind of fireworks surrounding it. You had former ambassadors to Israel saying you shouldn't be given the job. You had 48 Democrats, unprecedented vote against you. You talk about all that. And during that confirmation hearing, you also made this pledge under oath, I think. Have a listen. Do you support or will you advocate for Israeli annexation of the West Bank or of land in the West Bank? I will not. But you did advocate for that as ambassador. The New York Times wrote that you pushed mightily for annexation. In fact, you told the Times in 2019 that Israel has a right to annex parts of the West Bank. So were you lying to the United States Senate at your confirmation hearing? No, not at all. Number one, the fact that Israel has the right to sovereignty over significant portions of the West Bank over Judea and Samaria, which I believe is true, is different from exercising that right. So you need to make that distinction. Second of all, the, the work that we did with regard to Israeli sovereignty over Judea and Samaria while I was in office was in the context of a very detailed, carefully crafted peace plan that would have doubled the Palestinian footprint in the West Bank. Uh, it, was, it was in the context of a proposal to the Palestinians that, frankly, the Palestinians should have embraced instead of ripping it up at the Security Council. So, uh, no, I don't believe I was inconsistent at all with my testimony at the Foreign Relations Committee. But anyone who knows anything about the history of this conflict would know that the Palestinians are not going to welcome their land being annexed. And when you said at the time, you said publicly in January 2020, Israel does not have to wait at all to start annexing parts of the West Bank. Even Jared Kushner had to rein you in. No, that's, that's look, no, none, none of that is, look, Israel, your, your assumption that the Palestinians won't give up any of their land is, is really a, a very significant mistake. Uh, this is disputed territory. Uh, this land, it does not belong to the Palestinians. The Palestinians, to this juncture, have agreed with Israel to 40 percent of the West Bank areas A and B, as to which they maintain civilian control, and as to area A, they maintain military control. The, the Palestinians have 40 percent of the West Bank, and nobody in Israel is looking to take it away from them. But the rest of it, area C, has been subject to a dispute for many years. And, and people as great as the dean of the Yale Law School, who negotiated rule, uh, Security Council Rule 242, on behalf of the United States, Eugene Rostow thinks that Israel has the best claim of any competing party to the West Bank. So if you, if you assume the conclusion that it's Palestinian land that doesn't belong to Israel, you can get into a very uh, wrong direction. Uh, I, I mean, look, we could have, I don't think we have time tonight to discuss the entire history of the conflict. As you know, that's an outlier position. The world recognizes occupied territory. The Geneva, fourth Geneva Convention doesn't allow for settlements. I know you don't agree with that. You write about it in your book. But the point I was making is the Palestinians were never going to agree to annexation. And you came out for annexation after saying you wouldn't at your confirmation hearing. And even Jared Kushner had to come out and disown your comments, I think, several hours later. Jared and I had lots of discussions. It's all in the book. I don't want to go into the uh, the daily the, the daily TikTok between him and I. It's, it's we don't have time for that either. But um, look, the, the if, you know the the Palestinian um, the Palestinians. I, I don't think we disagree on one thing. I think we agree that the Palestinian people deserve better. I certainly uh, have worked for that over the four years that I was the ambassador. I think we disagree on the root cause of that that of those um, unfortunate yes. conditions. 
you blame Israel, I blame the Palestinian leadership. I blame the 12,000 terrorists in Gaza who hold 2 million people hostage in, Hamas, in, in Gaza. And I blame the Palestinian Authority, which is incredibly corrupt, has no record of human rights, treats its people terribly, has no freedom of religion, is misogynistic, and outlaws homosexuality. Now, you know, if you are prepared to put your finger on a state run by the Palestinian Authority, that's if, if that if your conscience is okay with that, that's fine. Mine is not. I don't think any American should be prepared to support a Palestinian state run by the PA. Now, if better leaders, so more forward okay, thinking leaders, let me come back in. You, you, you made your point. Let me let me jump back in there because you made a lot of points there. Your book suggests, and you just suggested in your answer a moment ago, that Palestinians don't want peace. It's, it's their fault. They don't want a two-state solution. What would you say to people who say it's Netanyahu who never wanted to make peace with the Palestinians, and that it was Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, who wanted to make a deal more than Netanyahu did? I don't think that's the case. Look, look. Um, my experience, and, I, and I, I had discussions, direct discussions, not with Abbas, but with all of his people. My, my, my sense was that on, on the core issues, there was never going to be a meeting of the minds. I mean, there, the, the Palestinian position was that every Jew had to leave um, the, the biblical heartland of Israel and Judea and Samaria, that it would become, in the words of, uh, of the Germans, Judenrein. Now, that's never going to happen. The Jews are never going to divide Jerusalem because, and, and nor could the Americans yeah. support that because the, the Jerusalem Embassy Act provides that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and it must be undivided. So, you Ambassador, know, these are, these are issues. You say, I don't think that's the case. That, Netanyahu, that Abbas wanted more peace than Netanyahu did. But those aren't my yeah. words. Those are Donald Trump's words from an interview last week that I just quoted to you. He said those words, that Abbas wants peace more than Netanyahu does. Netanyahu never wanted peace. So are you saying Trump's wrong, that he doesn't know what he's talking about, that he's lying? You know, in the book, somebody, so, you know, there were people that were trying to convince Trump that that was the case um, at various points in the presidency. He did feel that way. He did. And he said what he said. And uh, But I don't agree that... Um, that Abbas wants peace more than Netanyahu. Uh, I, I also that, don't think but, it's a but good it wasn't during his presidency, Ambassador. It was last year. He said in April 2021, I thought that Abbas wanted to make a deal more than Netanyahu. I don't think Bibi ever wanted to make peace. So we should ignore the president and listen to his ambassador. One of you is wrong. Which one? I, I don't know that either one of us is wrong. I think you're asking us to, uh, to, to, to be uh, clairvoyant into the minds of these two people. My experience, which was daily with Netanyahu and, 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 and often, with the Palestinian leadership was that they were gating issues. I don't think it was a question what anybody wanted. I think that the issues were insurmountable. And, uh, no, I, I understand, but I'm, I'm just trying to get sense here. It's not about clairvoyance. Trump says Bibi's to blame, Netanyahu. You say yep. Bibi's not to blame. I'm saying, who should we believe, the president of the United States or his ambassador to Israel? Which one of you? I think you should accept two different opinions from two different people. But he was your boss. He was the president. So he's wrong about the Middle East. He completely got the Middle East wrong. It's not wrong. It's not a question of being right or wrong. It's a question of his experiences, it is. which were. His, look, he is the boss. I mean, if if that's if that's his view and he's the president, that that view is going to prevail. But I'm just telling you, that wasn't my view. Okay, one word missing from your book, Ambassador. I look through is equality. Do you consider Palestinians to be equal to Israelis? Because for the past 55 years, Palestinians in the occupied West Bank haven't had the same rights as the Jewish settlers who live right next to them. It's why a lot of people, including Israeli human rights, claiming human Israeli human rights groups, talk about apartheid there. So, a simple question for you: Should Palestinians in the West Bank have the same rights today as their Jewish neighbors? I think within the, I mean, I think that subject to, it is a big subject to, subject to security issues, which are daunting in that area. I think the answer is aspirational, yes. I hope we get to that point. Remember, the Palestinians live under the control of the Palestinian Authority. So again, if you want to talk about certain rights and civil rights. No, they're an occupied people, Ambassador. The Palestinian foreign minister can't leave the West Bank without Israeli permission. Do you know of any foreign minister in any other country in the world who can't leave his own country without the permission of a foreign country? The, uh, the, the, the Palestinians um, have uh, civilian autonomy in that area. They have issues with travel. There are checkpoints that they go through. I wish those checkpoints were more efficient. They've actually improved significantly over the past um, few years. But th th there, there are daunting issues, and they're primarily security-driven. Uh, I, I understand and I the security arguments. I'm asking, should they have the same rights as Jewish settlers living in the same piece of land, literally next door to them? Because they don't right now. It's a simple question. Should they have equal rights, Palestinians and Jews living in the West Bank? Yes or no? 
I think Palestinians Jews should have equal rights, and I think Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews do have equal rights. They're both citizens of Israel, and they have that. That would be the model. I mean, they do have equal rights. So look at look at the Israeli Arabs. I mean, they're they're professors, they're doctors, they're lawyers. They're the, the chairman of the largest bank in Israel is an Arab, and 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 the understood. But Palestinians in the West Bank don't have equal rights. I'm saying, as of tomorrow morning, should they have equal rights or not, or do they continue having their rights denied? I think they have to. I, I think the Palestinians have to find a way to accept. Um, to, to accept Israel there, that Israel's not going away, that the enmity, the refusal to acknowledge Israel, uh, that, that, that's, that is going to be there, the, the terrorism, the, um, the, the violence, I mean, it's, it's got to get resolved holistically. And, and we can talk, and, and aspirationally, of course, we want them to have equal rights, exactly the way Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews have equal rights in the state of Israel. I, I hope that day comes. I pray for that day to come. Um, so, Ambassador, you talk a great deal about anti-Semitism in the book, including the anti-Semitism that you say you faced. And anti-Semitism is sadly on the rise here in America. Would you agree that it's deeply anti-Semitic for people to say things like, Jews control the media, Jews control Congress, Jews have divided loyalties? Sure. So when Donald Trump says that, doesn't that make him anti-Semitic? I haven't heard him say that Jews control Congress or, or I mean, I haven't heard him say I that. I can read it to you. He, I can read you the quotes. He said it to Barack Ravid last week. He said, there are people in this country that are Jewish. They no longer love Israel. It used to be that Israel had absolute power over Congress. Uh, there are Jewish people that run the New York Times, the Salzberger family. If anyone else said that, we would say that sounds like a, that sounds like a meeting of neo-Nazis. That sounds like a stormfront message board. Jews run the New York Times. Israel controls Congress. I think he's making a, uh, no, but I think he's making a different point. I think he's expressing, maybe inartfully, but I think what he's expressing, uh, his own disappointment, that notwithstanding the fact that he's done so much for the state of Israel, that the Jewish people in America, by and large, don't support him. And I think it's a great level, it's a great, great frustrating thing. By the way, it's frustrating to me. No, he says, he, that's not what he says. He says Israel should, he says Jews in America should love Israel. That's, that's a very anti-Semitic trope. Uh, American Jews should love America. They're not Israelis. He, he often referred to uh, Israel being your country, he once said in 2018 at the White House to a group of Republican Jews. That's anti-Semitism, is it not? If anyone else said it, we'd say that. I think American Jews should love Israel. It doesn't make me a, a subject to dual loyalty. Do you think, think Israel is? Do you think American? Jew, do you think Israel is American Jews' country? I think the Jewish religion has at its core the notion that God will restore the Jewish people to the land of Israel. If you're Jewish and if you believe it, you believe that Israel is the ultimate. Do you um, think Jewish people? I mean, that's that's not. Do you that think that's, Israel that's, controls Congress? Donald Trump says Israel used to control Congress. Do you agree with that? Uh, regrettably, no, I, I don't think that Israel—I think most of Congress right now is becoming very anti-Israel. But, but did Israel control Congress? Is Donald Trump right or wrong? No, I don't think anybody controls Congress. Well, one last question. At your confirmation hearings, you called members of J Street, the liberal Jewish American nonprofit, worse than kapos or concentration camp guards, the worst insult a Jew can give another Jew. In your book, you talk about this at length. You say it was a tactical mistake, but it was way more than that, wasn't it? It was deeply offensive, and you've never publicly apologized to J Street for saying it. I wonder, do you want to take this opportunity tonight to do so? I said in my book that I thought it was a terrible mistake, and I think that any analogy uh, any Holocaust analogy is inappropriate, and I actually, I really regret having said it. But I said that I do not at all regret uh, my arguments with J Street. I do think they are a, a very, very bad organization and a misleading organization because they claim to be pro-Israel. In fact, in fact, they're anything but. But do you don't want to apologize to them tonight? No, there's been so much, there's been so much uh, misconduct along the way by J Street towards me over the years. I don't think, I don't think it's time to make a unilateral apology. I mean, one day we'll have a cup of coffee with Jeremy Benami. Maybe we can, maybe we can shake hands and do it together. And we're out of time, but I'm keen to ask, as you know Donald Trump better than most of us. You say in the book that Trump uh, is, you say he's smart, he's funny, he's strategic. And I'll give you strategic, funny to some people. But smart? Seriously, you can't really believe that. This is a man who wanted to buy Greenland from Denmark, who thinks Frederick Douglass is still alive, who thinks windmills cause cancer. Matty, try building a 70-story building in Manhattan on budget ahead of time uh, and making money, and, uh, and, and, and you'll see how smart you have to be to do it. Ambassador David Friedman, we appreciate you taking time out tonight. The book is Sledgehammer, How Breaking with the Past Brought Peace to the Middle East. Thank you for your time.
Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.